Hello? <laughs> well, let's get started. Um, thank you all for coming on a rainy, dreary December day. Um, announcements this week, obviously, potluck. Um, sermon will probably be really quick because of my view, right? I'm looking at all the few the food, and I told Tony in the Sunday school will probably be a little quicker today. Um, but I want time for fellowship in between, too. It's important. So if you have any prayer requests, go ahead and put them in the, the, the back or wherever we have the prayer box or the offering box. Um, a lot of people are still sick. The sickness is just taking people down. Um, Paul and Miriam have been down for, I think, three weeks now, just really hurting. Uh, Kevin and Tori's kids, it's bouncing from kid to kid. Uh, so a lot of sickness going around. So just keep that in prayer as you think about it. And again, all the ways you can find us, you guys know. We are in Acts 2. We're going to finish chapter 2 today, 40 through 47. And we're going to talk about what is a healthy church. <clears throat> so Acts 2, 40 through 47. Again, I'll read through and we'll back up and go through it like we do. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. I have to stop here for just one minute because when I first read this, I'm like, whoa, Peter, I didn't know we were in 2023 in the Bible already. Because anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. And then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and in prayers. This will be our, that'll be our focus point today. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and, all, and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods, and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And Father, I thank you for this passage. I thank you for the outline of a healthy church, Lord, and may we see it today. Uh, may we seek to be healthy Christians, Lord, coming after you, seeking after you, putting everything else aside, surrendering, Lord, what we need to surrender. Lord, I ask today that you put away distraction, put away anything that's going to get in the way of what you have to say, including me, Lord. So we lift this up to you. We ask for a moving of your spirit here today. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So Acts 2, we're going to finish this out today. We have Peter. He had just given the first sermon. I encourage you, again, if you haven't read through it, go read through it a few times. It's amazing. It's, it's good. Um, and Peter, we went through that last week, what makes a good sermon, what, what Peter wanted to emphasize. And, and in many ways, this is just a continuation of that. And some of the same points will be hammered home, but, but I felt like they needed to be. So in Acts 40, it says, in many other words, he testified. So again, this isn't a verbatim thing. There's a lot of things he's saying here we don't have. And I love it says that he testified. Imagine what Peter is testifying about. Now remember on the Mount Tr Transfiguration, he was told, don't go tell anybody yet till after I ascended, right? He's free to talk about it now. Now imagine as he's proclaiming, I saw him in all his glory standing next to Moses and Elijah. Imagine the Jews hearing that. Right? He's testifying of these things. He's testifying of, he walked on water. I seen him walk on water. I testified that he is the Christ, the Son of God. Peter gets to testify of these things. And again, we love Peter. He's, he speaks first, thinks later. He's a man after God's own heart, I would say. He's like a David almost, right? We love Peter because he's us. And here he is. He, stu he stood up. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's standing in front of them. And he begins to testify, and he exhorts him them, it says. Exhorting can mean encouraging them, strengthening them. And there's another term that it can be used for. It can also mean beg them. And I see that in Peter's heart, don't you? These are his people. He loves them. And I see him begging them, come to Jesus, come to your Messiah. <clears throat> so the church that day will go from 120 to 3,120. 
Talk about the church growth program, right? We need some of them in the church. Not these programs that people are trying to sell all the time. I've already gotten one in the mail and I get a few emails every once in a while already. Want to grow your church? No. <laughs> the end of Acts says the Lord will grow it daily. He can grow his church. I don't want to grow the church because if it's based on me, that's the wrong thing. Let him grow the church. And it says they came from every nation under heaven, it says uh, in the few verses before. So imagine all these people, they come in, Peter testifies, they saw the tongues come down, they, they, they heard the, the wind, they saw the tongue, yeah, they saw the tongues, saw the tongues of fire, heard the tongues, that's where I was trying to go, and they come to the Lord, they get saved, 3,000 are going to come to the Lord here, and then he's going to send them back home. That's not proper church program, is it, right? You take them in, you make a discipleship program, you do all these things. But Peter didn't do this. The church, in so many ways, we miss what the point of what God is doing here in Acts. It is about the Holy Spirit moving. We set up programs. I'm not saying programs are bad. He didn't, Jesus didn't lay out how church should run. Well, you know, do 15 minutes of meet and greet, you know, sing six songs. I always sing six. Everybody, a few people have asked me, why do you do six songs? Because I'm OCD and we have to have three in the beginning and three in the end. That's why, okay? That's the only reason. It's not a spiritual thing. It's a Matt OCD thing. And, and... But the, the, none of that's laid out by us, right? It says the, the goal is follow the Holy Spirit. Be led by the Holy Spirit. And Peter here is led by the Holy Spirit. He's testifying. And it says they gladly received his word and baptized. And imagine this, 50 days earlier, you got to remember that there's probably those from the temple that are there. Again, this is the biggest, Pentecost is the biggest uh, feast attendance of all of them. We think it's usually Passover, but it's not. The travel lanes were better. I think I covered this in the beginning. And there's more here than any other time. So they have all these people coming in. It's springtime. They're coming in and Passover, the, the place is full and 3,000 come to Christ. It says from all over the world. And then he sends it back home. He baptizes them and sends them back home because the core of the issue is Jesus. It is coming to Jesus. That is his focus, and that's what he had preached about. And again, if you want more of that, go look at last week's message. But he gives them the basis, or, or um, Luke here is going to give us the basis of what a church is, and it's verse 42. And I'm going to hammer this verse home, and I apologize if it's like last week, but I just felt very led to continue on this. And it says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And if you're a highlighter or an underliner and you don't have that verse, I would highlight that verse. And I would emphasize continued steadfastly. That Greek word means a steadfast and single-minded fidelity to a certain course of action. It means that they were completely focused. It means persistent. It means enduring. It, it can also mean gave themselves over to. They continued steadfastly. It's almost redundant, continued and steadfastly. But there's an emphasis on each one of these things that Peter wants us to understand, which makes a healthy church. They were persistent and they weren't going to stop. It's funny how God does these kinds of things to me because there are many, many times more than I probably want, that I have stood up here and on the Sunday after that I have stood up here, I am like, Lord, send anybody else, not somebody else, anybody else. I am done. I am terrible. I have wasted their time. I have mumbled and don't even know what I said. And the Lord, every time, it's amazing. I swear, like Casey sends you guys all texts, encourage Matt, because I'll get messages. Hey, thanks, Matt. That really hit me. And I'm not saying that to be about me, but I want you to understand that when you plot along in what God has told you to do, you don't understand the impact of what he's doing through you. Plotting along is being faithful, and that's what he asks from us. So if he has given you something to do, whether it's your work, whether it's a ministry, keep plotting along no matter what. Be faithful if you know he's called that to you. And even in times it doesn't feel like it and you don't feel like it's working and you don't even know if you're, what you're saying makes sense, which is me 90% of the time I'm up here, keep plodding on because God's doing something. And it doesn't feel like it and it's hard and it hurts sometimes, but keep plodding on. Be steadfast, be consistent because that's what he asks of us. And I know it hurts. 
I know there's times that it hurts and there's times you're going to want to quit and you're probably your own biggest enemy in your own ministries. Right? Are we not? But keep plodding forward. That is faithfulness. So it says continue steadfastly. And so he outlines these four different things. This is what makes a healthy church. And he wants us to understand them. Have you ever met somebody that says that they're shopping for a church? I've heard that. I call it church hopping, right? They're hopping from church to church. Some people bar hop, some people church hop. They're going from church to church. They're looking for certain categories, right? And you've probably met them. You probably know them. Well, they need to have a nursery. They need to have a youth group. Again, none of these things are necessarily bad. Um, how do they dress there? Because I'm, you know, I want to come in sweatpants. I was glad. I'm going to embarrass Chloe and Eli. Last week, they're like, let's just wear sweatpants to church. I'm like, it's Calvary Chapel. Go ahead. You know, we can do that here. Dress how you want. Be comfortable. Be modest, but be comfortable. Suits or ties, jeans and t-shirts. What kind of ministries do they have to get into? And then I like this one. I've heard this. How long is the service? Because I've got like an hour on Sunday, right? I don't want more. And the pastor, does he go more than 25 minutes? Because my attention span is like 25. After that, I'm somewhere else. I've heard these things. I'm sure you have too. Is he up to date? Is he hip? Is he one of the pastors when he puts his arms out? You see the tattoos. You're like, wow, he's got a cool history or something, right? He's got something. Everybody's looking for this thing, and they're always looking for different things. Again, not necessarily wrong. Maybe the tattoo thing might, might be a little wrong. But they're, they're looking for something, but there's little conviction on these four things that Peter lays out, right? You hear everything else, but like, is the teaching solid? Are the people in fellowship and in love with each other? Are they in breaking of bread? And not breaking of bread, we'll get to that in a little bit more detail. Are they, are they meeting together? Are they, do they like to be together? And are they in prayer? It's, those are the four things that are the focal point that Peter points out, but everybody's so concerned about all the other things. And again, I'm not saying they're wrong and go to where the Lord leads you. I would encourage you, if you're watching online and you're church hopping, shopping, that's fine. Go, go wherever the Lord leads you. But make sure you keep those four things in focus and foremost in the front. And we'll go and expand on each one of those. Two, don't look for a church that's perfect because if you find one, don't join it because you're going to ruin it because you're not perfect. There is no perfect church, and I'm going to upset all of you. I'm not a perfect pastor. Just not. The church is full of imperfect people, is it not? And sometimes that's what makes us more at home. Because if it was full with a bunch of perfect people all the time, I would feel really out of place. <clears throat> God is perfect, and he's given us perfect outlines for a church. So a couple of things first before we get into this. What is church? What's the purpose of church? The Greek word for church is ekklesia. It means called forth or called out of. Here's a couple different definitions I took from different people. A company of Christian or of those who, hoping for eternal salvation through Jesus Christ, observe their own religious rites, hold their own religious meanings, and manage their own affairs according to regulations prescribed for the body for order's sake. I like that. Uh, those anywhere in a city village constitute such a company and are united into one body. The whole body of Christians scattered throughout the earth. The assembly of faithful Christians already dead and received into heaven. I kind of like that one too. Many think, and as a kid I used to think, that we went to church. Right? You go to church. Well, and when I was a kid, my dad said, we don't go to church, we go to the chapel, which is interesting because now we go to Calvary Chapel. You go to the chapel, the church, and I know I'm preaching the choir a little bit, but the church is not a building. It is not a cathedral, and just because of the way the walls are shaped or anything else doesn't make that place any more holy. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? He reiterates it. He wants you to understand it twice. You are the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You are the indwelling of God. 2 Corinthians 6.16 says, And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. And as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 
The church building, again, is not where God dwells. That building is not any more holy than any other building. It is you. It is you that make it. I'm here before most of you, and when I walk in, this place is not holy. And especially during October when you come in and all the Halloween decorations are up. You guys are the one, when you come in here, you make this building the church. Because you are the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. You are, you are it. So the purpose of the church, or what the church is, it's for Christians. It's a gathering of, of Christians. It's us. We are the indwelling. We are the church. What is the purpose of the church? First and foremost, to bring glory to God, ultimately. That is the purpose of the church. He is in the front, in the forefront. He is preeminent. He is head of the church. We'll get into more of that a little bit. The second role of the church is to make disciples. The Great Commission. We know in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, and Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Our mission as the church is the Great Commission to go make disciples. And in many ways, this is why Jesus has not come yet. When we get to the prophecy update, he is waiting for the church age to end. So all that he has set aside for salvation, when they all get saved, boom, we're out of here. Imagine if you knew who that last person was. Imagine how you would pray for them. Would that not change your life? I would probably quit my job and follow them around. The priest probably would help at all. Like, I'm ready to go. Let's go. Get saved. I would probably be nonstop. But imagine that. Imagine if you knew it was that family member you were praying for. Imagine how much more you would pray. And we don't know. It should fire up our prayer when we find this out. When we realize how close we are. He says, oh, I'm with you even to the end of the age. How close we are to the end of the age. In the prophecy update, we'll see how close I think we are. We would pray. We would be on fire for people. So our mission is the Great Commission. <clears throat> So who's in charge of the church? I know you guys all know this, but it's good to clarify. Who runs this? Who's in charge? And it's not me, big shocker. I am not in charge of this place. 1 Corinthians 1.16 says, He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. Jesus is the head of the church. He is in charge of the church. You all have permission to always go above my head for what goes on in this church. In other words, go to Jesus and pray about what's going on if you don't like something. You can come to me too, but you can go pray. You can go above my head. You can go to my boss, and you can ask him to change what's going on in the church. Charles Spurgeon used to say, there's way too much roast pastor Sunday afternoons because people would go home and, of course, just roast the pastor. But Jesus is in charge. Just remember who you're roasting when you roast the pastor. He's in charge. That's his person he put there. This is his body. He is the head. He leads where it looks. He should be the very thoughts of the thing going on in the church. He should be the very vision of the church. The leadership, the human leadership of the church, better be speaking the inspired word of God. And I'm not talking about that they're infallible. They can be fallible because they're still human. But they better have it all based in Scripture he is the source of the church. Any church that does not make Jesus the source or the head is failing. I'm not going to say they are failing because they might not look like they are, but they, they are failing. They may have a huge gatherings of people, but if Jesus is not the head of that gathering, they are failing those people. And they are nicely escorting those people to the very gates of hell. <clears throat> There's way too many pastors that have done it in their own pride. If I start doing this in my own pride and you catch it, you have every right to call me out. And if I don't shape it up, run for the hills. Too many churches base it off of a man's personality or a program. It's based on Jesus. Are you getting fed there? Are you learning the word there? A church without Jesus at his head is like a chicken with its head cut off. I don't know how many of you have seen that. They run around for a while with no direction and no purpose, and eventually what do they do? Boop, fall over dead. 
That is like a, the church without Jesus as its head. It is a direct list. List. Direct list, list. I'm not even going to try to say it again. But you know what I mean. They are just running in circles, doing nothing. They are already dead, and they don't know it yet. And one day they're going to fall over. And then you have to face God for real. This applies to us too. We can look at the church and say this entity needs to have these certain things, but all of this applies to us too as individuals. Is Christ the head of your life? When you think about what your head does, right? Your brain's up there, everything's up there, everything that keeps this thing going is all up there. Is everything that's going on in your life governed by Jesus? And if it's not, it's time to do some self-check and self-examination. The great thing is, is if you are, are, or no, not perfect, but if you are serving the Lord, if you are going after him, you are a mighty member of the body of church. Do you realize that? Because the church is a body, and we'll get into that a little bit too. But if you are the weak link in the body, then everybody's going to help gather around you and strengthen you. If you are the strong one in the body, you're going to encourage the body to drive on, right? If your finger is hurt, the rest of your body reacts to that finger hurting. And the first thing you do is your mouth speaks, hopefully not a bad word, but that's usually what comes out. You grab your finger and we'll say, ow, and all your body tenses and all of it reacts. That's how tight-knit we're supposed to be. That if one person here is hurting, we should all like, gather prayer, not to center them out, not to embarrass anybody, but, but to, to lift them up, to encourage them, to, to help tape and alleviate the pain. <clears throat> An effective church, a healthy church, must have strong, biblically-led individuals at the top. The human leadership I'm talking about now. In Ephesians 4, through 4, 11 and 12, And he, Jesus, gave himself some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. We're going to focus in there on pastor teachers. In between there, that and, we talked about this a week or two ago, the Granville Sharps rule. That is one gift. It is unified together in the Greek. It is one gift. Pastor teachers is a singular gift. It would make no sense for me to be a pastor and not a teacher, would it not? That would be weird. And it's the other way around. And I can think of, as a kid, the people that were my Sunday school teachers, in many ways they were my pastor, as in they shepherded me too, right? They would call you out. If they were a good Sunday school teacher, they would call you out if you were doing something wrong, right? And they would answer your questions. So we, we kind of take that, we've made pastor a role, but it's a gift, but it's, it's a role. Because it, it could also mean bishop, elder, overseer, and again, shepherd. That's what a pastor is. The role of the pastor is to feed, to tend, protect, and lead the flock of God. The pastor teacher is a calling. It is a calling to be a pastor teacher. I believe I had mine, wow, 17 years ago. Ooh, I'm getting old. I was 30, so now you all know how old I am. And he spoke very clearly to me. And I thought, that's weird. I'm never pursuing that. And I didn't. But I started living like it. I remember I got all crazy. Casey made me go to the doctor once because I wasn't sleeping. I was reading my Bible every night. I was sneaking Bibles into people's backpacks at work. I would put, I would put them in their backpacks when they weren't paying attention. Um, and then I just tried to live it. And when we moved down here... I didn't tell my own pastor for years that I felt cold because I never wanted that to influence his decision in anything I did. So one day, after just serving there, doing the stuff behind the scenes, he said, Matt, I'm going to be out in a couple of weeks. Can you cover? And my jaw dropped and I started tearing up because at that point it had been 12 years ago about. And all of a sudden I see God bringing into fruition what he was doing. God will bring you to your calling. You don't have to pursue your calling. When you see that there, there it is. The doors begin to open, walk through. You don't want that. You don't want to miss that opportunity. But as God calls you, he will lead you and he will bring you to it. And I never thought in a million years I would be here in Maryland. <laughs> I thought I was going back to PA. I told Casey, look, at, let's look up here in PA and look there. No, God brought me over here. <laughs> I heard once, and it drove me nuts, that the pastor-teacher calling is the highest calling. And that is false. 
That is false. The calling that God has laid on your life is the highest calling that you could possibly have. I am no higher of a calling than you guys. Now, Scripture does say I'm doubly accountable, and it says in Thessalonians that I'm double honor. I don't care about all of that. I'm just trying to follow what he has told me to do. And it's the same with you. If he has called you to go be a nurse, go be the most God-led, spirit-led nurse that you're supposed to be. A mechanic, be the same thing. Because he has put you there for a reason, and there's people that are around you that he wants you to testify of him about. Peter was a fisherman. And it was time for him to stand up. He stood up. But then through the rest of this, we'll see him for a while, and then he fades off the scene, right? We don't see him again. We know he's in the background. He's doing things. He's, he's preaching. But go toward your calling. There is no higher calling than, than whatever God has called you to do. To your accountable for your own calling that God has laid on your life. I am going to be held accountable for how faithful I am to this calling up here. Joe Foch used to say that there are going to be grandmothers in heaven that are going to get more rewards than Billy Graham because they were faithful in praying for their grandchildren because that was the calling that God laid on their heart. So follow the calling, whatever it is. Follow it all the way through because your rewards are based on you. Don't look at someone who's in the public scene and think, wow, look at their calling. No, don't do that. It's not a higher calling. Your calling is the highest calling that you can have. Two pastors are responsible. They are responsible for declaring the whole counsel of God. Acts 20, 27, he says, Paul would say, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. And I am pleased to say, in the, as of the book of John, I declared the whole counsel of God to you guys in the book of John. And when we get to the end of Acts, I can do that again. And I will do it probably after every book. And that's the wonder of this, right? We just go verse by verse. I can't avoid a topic. And if I do, you better call me out. Because I don't want to mess up my calling either. I don't want God coming back at me. It says he has not shunned. Again, that word shun means held back, shrink. A pastor should not do that. And there is way too many pastors that do that today. There are way too many of them that shrink back from declaring the whole counsel of God or skip over passages or they don't things they don't want to address. <clears throat> so the four things, again, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. That's the word of God. We've touched on this a little bit. But they were steadfast in the Bible. They were unyielding in their study of the Bible. They continued. They kept going. They were committed. They stood in the word despite what culture told them. No matter what was going around them, they were steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. The Bible will give you direction and purpose. It is a defense against temptation. It brings healing and comfort. It helps you grow and produce fruit, even during drought. It is a sword to take down enemies, this word of God. And I got to that part of the, 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 when it talked about the sword, and it reminded me of my days in the Marines. And the thing that you do more in the Marines when you're infantry, as I was, than anything else is train. You train in the rain. You train in the snow. I've trained in the desert. I've trained on mountaintops. I've trained on the backs of ships. You train at night. You train in the day. You train without sleep for days on end. You train, you train, you train. That's what we did. 90% of my life in the Marine Corps was training out in the elements. But one thing while I trained that I always and I mean it, always had with me was my weapon. I always, I carried an M249 saw for most of my Marine Corps career. And I knew that weapon inside and out. I knew the serial number. I knew the weight of it when it had ammunition in it and when it didn't. It slept in my sleeping bag with me in the mountains of Norway. It was next to me in the desert, tucked in the bag right next to me as I slept. Because if somebody came to grab my weapon, the strap was wrapped around my leg at night. You're pulling me with you. I knew that weapon inside and out. I could take that weapon apart blindfolded and put it back together. That was my weapon, and I understood it. To this day, I still remember the serial number of that number. Serial number. And it's really easy because it was 0011000, stock number 13. That was my weapon, and I knew it. I knew everything about it. I knew where I wanted the strap fixed as I hiked. I remembered how tight I wanted certain elements of it. I knew how, when the, the 
Uh, they have bipods. When they popped out, when they didn't work, I knew everything about that weapon, everything. That's how well we should know our Bible. It never goes anywhere without us. If anybody touches us, they're touching that too, right? That is our weapon. The Bible is our weapon. Second Timothy 4.2 says, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, re rebuke, exhort with all long suffering." Just like I was with my M249 saw, I was ready with it in season and out of season. I was in the mountains of Norway, and I remember it was so cold. I won't give you the graphic details, but it was very, very cold. You would get up in your tent, and then we'd have a tent over our tent because it was so cold, and that's where you dressed and you put on overwhites. They were cracking and crinkling because they were frozen with the snow as you put them on, on. I was out in the desert, and I remember it being so hot laying on the floor, but that rifle was strapped across my back. It was right there at all times. It was always with me in season and out of season, whether I wanted it or not. It was always with me. I learned on planes that I could, this is such a side story, but with your helmet and your chin strap, you could put it like this and it would prop your head up and you could sleep just like this with, your, with the, the barrel right here and you could just fall asleep. I don't know why I told you guys that one, but know your weapon. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 5, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. This is an end times warning. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth, and will be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. We need to know sound doctrine, because that's the only way... We can identify false doctrine. Again, one of the one that most people use is, is the $100 bills. When people start in banks, they give them the $100 bills, and they feel them, and they touch them, and they walk around with them. You know why? They never give them fake ones. As soon as that fake one comes through, they know it because they have felt it. They know the feel. They know the touch. They know the textures. They know everything about that, and that should be the same thing with us. Once something comes across, and you're like, ooh, that's good. That means you've studied your word, and we should be doing that. <clears throat> and it says at the end times that they're not going to so tolerate sound doctrine and they're turning aside the fables and, and just talking about how I watch way too much YouTube on this and they, they are going off on some weird tangents about the Bible now. I think last prophecy type update we talked about aliens and stuff. Now it's, it's just, it's insane. I'm not going to, I'll go off on a tangent again. The next thing in the church, so they followed sound doctrine. They continued steadfastly in it, and they continued steadfastly in fellowship. That word fellowship is the word koinonia. You've probably heard it if you've been around the church enough. There is actually no good English translation for this word. We use fellowship because it's as close as we can get, but it's much deeper than just fellowship. It means to share oneself intimately. It means association, community, communication, and joint participation. It's the idea that you're giving and you're getting at the same time. It's not just fellowship. There's something being exchanged in the middle of this. The idea is you are joined together with these people. That's a koinonia. It, again, we, it's not just fellowship. It means can mean tightly knit. We should do more than just hang out in the church, though that's good. The idea is that you know. You know each other. You know when you come in and that person has a look on your face. Are you okay? Do you need prayer? It's, it's that idea of, of, oh, man, I know that you're out this. Let me help you, right? That's what should be going on in the church. It should be constant and continuous, right? This is another end times warning. Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And is the day not approaching? We were just talking about before, like, that's the number one thing that we will do, right? When we're in a, a tough situation or something's just weighing on us, if we're in a bad mood, the first thing you want to do is not go to church. I remember we used to have prayer in my old church on Tuesday nights. And I almost never wanted to go, but I never left feeling like I shouldn't have went. I always felt refreshed. It's those times that we have to be faithful. That's when the plodding comes on. Just plod through, go, 
be there. Be amongst the, the brothers and sisters. I have never left here not feeling recharged by all of you. Because it's not me. It's not up here. But you guys have made me feel recharged. And that's what we do, right? If, if someone falls down, do we not help another up? Don't forsake it. If you're online and you watch and all you do is watch, stop. Go to a church. Go somewhere. I understand health issues. We have those, right? And I understand that there's certain times and situations, of course. But we need to be plugged into a fellowship where people learn us and get to know us. You need to be in a place where people can pray for you. You need to be in a place where people are willing to help you and be humble to take that. And the flip side of that, too. We need to be in a place where we're helping others. That comes back to your own personal health. If you're healthy, if you're walking with the Lord and you're strengthened, the Holy Spirit will reveal those things. And all of a sudden, you're going to be a major player within the church. And, then, and not a show, not, not a big thing, not, hey, come let me heal you in front of everybody. Not any of that weirdness, but let me take you aside and pray for you. I don't even need to know the details. And that strengthens the whole body. First Corinthians 12, 25 through 27 says that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and the members individually. We touched on that a little bit. That's how close we should be. We should be functioning like a body. We should be doing the work of an evangelist, it says. It doesn't say you have to be an evangelist, but it says you should be doing the work of an evangelist. And that's the, the body's function, as we said, that one of the roles of the church is to go and make disciples. As we function together and as we love one another, that should be a drawing of the world. Why do they love each other so much? Look at them. They don't even look alike. They don't act alike. They have different personalities. They collide with each other. But you know what? They love each other. And that should be what the world sees in. Look, when that one was hurting what they did for them. Or look, that person had got their new job, got their new promotion, and they were all happy and celebrated and were happy for them. And, but that's how we should be. That's how family is, right? Sometimes we don't all get along. Sometimes we're going to say things that irritate each other. I mean, I know in, in, in my marriage that never happens, probably maybe someone else's, but that, that never happens. We don't get on each other's nerves. But that's the way it's supposed to be, that there's these roles that, that we're uplifting. And this, yes, there's times we're going we're gonna to fight. We're just going to be friction. But learn to work that out. So a healthy church is a unified church. It's a koinonia church. The next thing is they continued steadfastly in the breaking of bread. Wow, I'm going way longer than I thought I would. That can mean two things. It can mean just sharing a meal, like I'm looking back in the back right now. We're going to share a meal together. And it can mean, of course, communion, where we can take communion together. I like Christmas. You guys can probably tell by the music. I like Christmas time. I like Christmas music. And there's always something about singing the old Christmas carols that you sing every year, right? You sing them all the time. There's nothing new about them. You know what's going on. But I always like when, when you're at a Christmas Eve service or everybody's sitting there and they're singing that Christmas music. To me, there's always seems like there's this peace, right? Just like this peace, maybe because it's Christmas Eve and all the shopping's done and all the parents are done being panicked. But, but whatever it is, to me, it always seemed like there was this peace that came over everybody. And it was like for once we finally got all our perspective together again, right? It's all about Jesus. And it was all about him coming. And we're so happy about that. Because he came for us. And in with that, we kind of sing and we sing the same songs year in over and over again. And that peace kind of settles. Well, I feel like communion is the same thing. It puts perspective back in the right place when we take the bread and realize that his body was broken for us. And it puts it all back in perspective when you, when you drink that cup and you take that blood and recognize that he did that for me. And there's a peace that settles and it puts things back in perspective. And Jesus doesn't need us to do that for him. He asks us to do it for us. He doesn't need it, is what I'm trying to say. He doesn't need us to do it for him. He wants us to, because it puts things back in perspective. So they continued steadfastly, and that means nonstop. They continued. And imagine them, right? Like, they're getting together. It says they went from, we'll see a little bit later, they went from house to house. They ate, they joined together. And I bet they did communion often. And I'm sure sometimes it was probably wine and sometimes it was whatever grape juice they could find laying aside and whatever bread was left over. But they, they did it 
steadfastly and continuously because it kept the correct perspective, right? So the continued steadfast and the breaking of bread. You can break bread at home, by the way. It doesn't have to be in the church. A husband and wife can sit down and have communion together. You can do it with your kids. We've done it a long time ago, but we did it together before. You can have communion together. And we will do communion Christmas Eve. Lastly, it says they continued steadfastly in prayer. Prayer is mentioned over and over again in Acts. You see them praying. They're continuous in praying. The Holy Spirit fell when they were praying. And they were a tight-knit group that prayed together a lot. We'll see Peter who will be praying by himself later on. We're going to see Paul praying later by himself. They prayed together. They prayed alone. They prayed with each other two at a time, I'm sure, five at a time. Whatever they could do, they could pray. Be in prayer. Jeremiah 33 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. That's God asking us to do that. Call to me, he's asking, and I'll answer you. He guarantees that. The problem is, is most of the time we don't like the answer because it's usually wait or no. Because we're just looking for yes 90% of the time. Lord, you're not answering my prayer. And he's like, I've answered your prayer. You just don't want to hear the answer right now. Call to him, he says. And I love how he says, says, I will answer you and show you great and mighty things. And you know, there's nothing more great and mighty than the cross. When you think that you're looking for something new, it's usually not the new things that stun us. It's usually the things that we know that give a fresh spirit to it. When we look at the cross again and we come to our knees again and recognize a need for our Savior. And of course, we have 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, that promise was given to Israel, but I think that still applies to today. I think of what's going on in the church. There needs to be more continuous, steadfast prayer. But even more than that, there needs to be continuous, steadfast prayer at home. And I will be the first to confess we are not as good as as we used to be. This, <laughs> this has taken a lot. And many times, Casey and I, we would read our Bible and we would pray and we would go to bed and then this all happened and I'm studying and I'm passing out at night and we look at each other, we're like, and I'll be honest, she's usually the first one to call me out. We haven't prayed together in a few days and then we'll pray together. Be praying together. You want to strengthen your marriage? Pray together. You want to strengthen your relationship with your kids? Pray together. It says in verse 43 through 45 that fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as everyone had need. So again, a healthy church went and saw signs and wonders. And I love that. Next chapter, we're going to see Peter heal a guy and just get up and he'll start following him around, holding on to Peter. There were signs and wonders done, and I pray and believe God can do that again today. I'm hoping and praying he will begin to do that again here in America. We need some signs and wonders, I think, because we have lost our our way. We have lost faith, and he wants to do it. I believe that. I believe the gifts are for today, and they can be used today, and they will advance the church and advance his kingdom. It says... In this passage that they were, again, that they were all unified together. They had all things in common. And like we talked about, if somebody had a need, they proposed it. You didn't see a thermometer on the wall. Hey, if we raise this much money, we can get a new building. You didn't see, hey, this ministry really could use some money. You didn't hear any of that. They had all things in common, and they were just giving to each other as they saw need. Because a healthy church will do that. <clears throat> It says in Matthew 24, in the end times, that the love of many will grow cold. And I see that within the church, not ours per se, but in the church by and large, that there is a coldness. Is there not? I don't want that here. I want koinonia. I want fellowship and strong fellowship. So 46 through 47, I told Tony we'd be done early. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food, and I love this, with gladness and simplicity of heart. They ate together gladly, and it was simple. 
Have you ever gone somewhere and it's so complicated you don't understand what's going on? Do I dip my food over here or do I put it over here? Why is there six forks? What do I need six forks? I'm, not, I'm sure that's not what he's talking about when he talks about simplicity, but it's the idea that they were grateful. They were grateful for whatever was provided. It was simple. It didn't have to be extravagant. Don't we do that? Like somebody's coming over. I always joke that we needed two houses. We need one house where we actually live and another house where we invite people because we... When people are coming over, you have to go clean your house like you don't live there anymore, right? Like, it's nothing like what it was. But it's simplicity and gladness. I'm sure Jesus would love to come over in your messy house and eat a piece of pizza with you. It's just simple, just to be together, just to be in koinonia. And it said that they praise God. In other words, they worshiped. The healthy church worships together. They're not worried if it's contemporary. They're not worried if it's classical. They're not worried about all the drums are too loud and the guitar is too loud and whatever else all the people complain about. They just sat there, probably a cappella most part, and just sang and worshiped the Lord. A healthy church worships the Lord. And it doesn't matter if it's on Spotify, and this is what the Lord had to tell me this week, or it's a worship leader. As long as their heart is, they're worshiping the Lord. Because a healthy church worships the Lord. And it says that the church daily, those who are needed to be saved, I should add it, and the Lord added. I put church daily for those who added needed to be saved because that's how I look at myself. I don't need to add to the church. God will do it. The Lord will add. He's the important part, the first part. The Lord will add to the church daily. All the church pro growth programs, I'm sure there's something good in some of them, but if you're trying to grow a church and not grow the people, your motivation is wrong. And there's too many people that want to be encouraging and want to be strengthening, but they're not investing in the people. If you're, they're, you're just giving a message, message that's encouraging and you want people to leave feeling good, you've failed the church. There's times where I have sat in the pew and I have been convicted. Pew, I say pew. That's all. It was a long time ago I sat in a pew. Um, and the tears ran down my face because there's times I need to get to church and the Lord needs to convict me because sometimes it's the only time I'll slow down. So the Lord will add and he will do. It's not up to the pastor. It's not up to the church leadership. We can come up with programs and whatever else, but God will add. And I am amazed that you guys come and come back. <laughs> I'm always amazed and I thank him for it. But he will add. It's all about him, if you notice, through all of this. We fellowship because of him. Of course, we read the word because of him. We do breaking of bread because of him sending his son. We gather together, we pray because we want him to be the focus of everything. A church should be focused about Jesus Christ, and that's it. If it's focused about anything else, again, it's like that chicken with the head cut off. And again, that applies to us personally. That applies to us. Put him first. Again, I've said many, many times, I put, can put things in the way so quickly, so fast. And it's in the mornings when I sit with him. He's like, I'm glad I could finally have a word with you because we got a few things to talk about. And sometimes they're good and sometimes they're convicting. So make time for him. Let's rely on him. Let's be praying for one another. There is nothing wrong with grabbing another person here and saying, hey, let's pray for a minute. Um, we're not going to do prayer after service today because we have fellowship time, and that's important too. And I'm going to close with that. We're going to pray, and then we will worship the Lord, and I think I have all Christmas songs. So. Father, I thank you for this. I thank you for how you've outlined what a healthy church is, Lord. This is your outline. This is what you want. This is what you want to see here, and I pray uh, that we can be a church that does these things, Lord. But with that, mostly we are a church that is after your heart, Lord and that we are individuals that are after your heart. Lord, take away anything that gets in the way of that. Take away whatever it is, Lord. We can put so many things, even ministry itself, Lord. I, I know I can put that in front of you. So whatever it is, Lord, be the focus, be the center of it all. We love you, we praise you, we lift this worship to you. In Jesus' name, amen.